I'm uh, really thrilled to be here to read with Chris and, and Bonnie, to meet Ron after a very long time of submitting and, and being published by AQR, for which I am extremely grateful. Um, I'm hoping that everybody will remember that this is a benefit series and will continue to support in AQR and help them reach their goal. And I'm gonna begin with uh, several poems from my wilderness and end with a newer poem. Uh, this is the title poem. I tried to grow what others grew, eggplants and zinnias, tomatoes, dahlias, even corn. But there were too many trees, the darkness beneath them growing mushrooms, fawn lilies and trillium as the years I longed for sun passed and I learned to love the trees. This winter, the day the ice storm came, branches cracked and fell all morning, taking others with them. And in the afternoon, a maple and a cherry fell across the roof. At dusk, when it was over, the owls, two and three and maybe four, more than I'd ever heard, echoed the day's losses. But because I live among the trees, my worst dream is of the bulldozers, which will come someday after this hillside has been logged. They'll come the way they did to the old cherry orchard, where every spring someone raked the earth around the still leafless trees, the tine lines visible from the road. And then one day I'd round the corner and come upon them, their endless clouds of blossom. It takes so much work to turn an orchard into a bare field, ready for a subdivision, trunks split, stumps chained, wrenched, and dragged away, all of it worse than any storm. Because branches gathered for kindling, trees cut and chopped, spring does recover what a month ago seemed broken, the big leaf maples filling in the gaps. If I have to leave here, I'll never leave in spring. I won't leave the wisteria dangling outside my window, the globes of rhododendrons out under the firs suspended like red lanterns in the rain. It takes a long time to learn how to live anywhere. The irises last a season or two, then dwindle. The daylilies lasted 20 years before their roots gave way to rot. But the wisteria, the rhododendrons, the maples, firs, and wild cherries receive themselves. Even the difficult oak keeps growing. And the roses. If I could say what a life is, I'd say roses. How they taught me early of desire in the way a man bent laying pipe on a Sunday to make a rose garden for his wife because he couldn't love her any other way. And when the marriage fell to ruin, it was the roses that survived, each bud unfurling through dog and drought. I'd tell how I planted the Abraham Lincoln for my mother because it was her favorite, though as it turned out, I planted it too close to the path. And so she brushed against it every morning as it stood wet with dew. And when she fell and had to leave her home forever, I cut her deep red roses and brought them to her in her hospital bed. And then she did not cry. But those were hybrids, vulnerable to, to bug and mildew. My roses are old roses. They love the shade. They sprawl over trellises that barely bear their weight. They twine among the trees, blossoming in clusters, tiny and uncuttable bright beacons in the twilight world under a sky I cannot see for green. They smell of musk and when I try to train them, they won't mind. Fierce with thorns, they snag my arms, draw blood. And yet I scrape the moss off the flat blue stones that lead to them, as if I were scrubbing the steps of a church or shrine so I could stand beneath them when they bloom. If I leave here, it will be because I cannot tend what I barely tend now. 
If I leave, I'll leave in autumn, the rose canes dead, leaves turning yellow. I'll leave the way my mother did, never looking back. So this poem, um, Eternity or Infinity, I believe is in the current issue of uh, AQR. And uh, I owe a debt to Ron and the poetry staff for asking me to take off the last line of the poem. I think Ron said, "Do you would you would you entertain this?" I and I miss this in editing uh, over a long year time of publishing poems in journals. Nobody does it anymore. Um, and I really appreciated it. So here's here's eternity or, or, or infinity. It's a question mark. <clears throat> I've thought them interchangeable. They even sound alike. But today tells me one has more light and is like looking out at the sea and finding I have to look away because the blue, the froth of the waves, the white variations of tidal sands and whiter birds gathered to search for tiny shrimp and worms in the outgoing tide are too bright to look at. And though the sea seems infinite, this view with people and dogs strolling, everyone remarkably cordial, even the dogs, could be the eternity any, anyone would be happy to have here on a late February day on the Oregon coast, where the temperature will reach 60 degrees when Boston is still under three feet of snow after weeks of endless storms. I know infinity isn't this bright. I think it has an ominous sense of the undertow, less what we imagine than something so big we can't. I don't think my mother thought about infinity each morning when she set off for the bus stop on her way to work. She thought about how time lived in the number of steps to the bus stop and how many minutes it took to walk them. And doesn't infinity have to do with the time we don't have, never had, with why it will be 60 degrees here today when it's still snowing in Boston? keeping kids home from school and parents from going to work and eventually not paying their bills. My mother lived that way too, paycheck to paycheck, yet she knew someday eternity would be her, her reward. And it occurs to me that if you believe in eternity, maybe infinity doesn't matter, even as it threatens to spin us back into where we came from from which from which does which does make eternity a lot more appealing in infinity what we'd like to forget because isn't it true that mostly all we want to do is make a story about how we got here and why we're good enough to stay This is a poem uh, about a long marriage it's called The Orchards. There were problems to be solved then, decisions to be made. Now we walk and walk through the orchards, the cannery orchard, the nursery orchard, the black cherry orchard. We walk to the river, the far boundary, high and wide, deep and brown a ganglia of branches tumbling, shooting down the rapids, then caught by the branch of a down tree. There's a man sitting on a bench, aiming a long lens, an old couple walking who stopped to pet our young dog. The nursery orchard makes me think of how the decisions quieted, moved on, how long ago I'd take those tests in secret and never the right color, I thought it was him. Later, I found out it was both of us. And oddly, that made it better, our decision made. The young trees in this orchard were grown for transplant, or maybe they just took cuttings because now they're as gnarled as the tree in the meadow they call the wedding tree, the which was split in a storm. Its fallen branches still scattered around the still living base. It's the goat orchard I keep wondering about, though. 
Did the goats run there the way the dogs do now in their endless loops? Last night, I saw a photo of goats standing in the branches of a tree they climbed to eat its nuts. At first, they looked much too heavy to ride the branches, 10 of them standing in the same tree. And then they looked as light as horned birds. So yes, the decisions lessen, but the problems remain. The one about the heart, the way it rises, the one about finding your way to it, as if walking in a maze of so many orchards, each one needs a name. I'm carefully looking at the time here. Um, this book is, this poem is called Return. And many of the poems in, the, are, in this book are about my mother who lived to the age of 100 years and eight days. Return. I was reading about faith. The author said we return to what we believed in when we were young. But I can say with certainty, I did not believe in a God. Maybe gods though. The ones I found in the Edith Hamilton mythology my mother gave me when I was a kid. As for return, the word says something about time I don't understand, unless it's the way I stood at the kitchen sink washing dishes and staring at my mother's collection of birds and one brass giraffe she bought at the zoo. I wondered if I put away all the things she wanted me to remember her by, would I keep remembering? Then I recalled that after she retired, she loved going to the zoo. And how one day when I went with her, we sat on a bench and she reached into her straw bag and gave me a sandwich and an apple. When I was a kid, there was never enough time for just sitting on a bench eucalyptus rustling overhead, eating our lunch. She was too busy just getting by. But on that bench, it seemed we could return to what we never had and have it, as we did one day in the hospital last winter, while we waited hours for a doctor to come and talk about hospice. Then nothing hurried, and as if we were on that bench again, my mother, growing weightless, tiny as her time was ending, told me how for a quarter she'd flown high above Long Beach in a two-seat plane 80 years before, and how one day she'd gone to a mortuary with a friend who worked there because she wanted to see a body and did, and found she was not afraid of what she saw. And though I've often thought she told the same stories over and over, I'd never heard either of these. We talked on and on, and when I thought to thank her for the mythology, she asked why I liked the Greeks. And by now, I know it's because they never die, but live unknown among us. She was quiet then, so I asked if there was anything she wanted to know about what was coming, and she said, yes, when will I die? She knew I couldn't answer. But I told her again, there were ways of making dying easier, ways to prepare. And when the doctor did come, she listened and signed the papers. Though in the end, I don't know that it was easier, just a kind of map to follow what can't be followed. Until as I imagined it, she stepped off a cliff the way we do in dream, but this time kept on falling. And I'll end with a, a poem called Ways of Seeing with a nod to John Berger, but uh, this is the end of, we're approaching the first year of the pandemic. Ways of Seeing. Yesterday, my neighbor wearing his mask was taunted by two younger men in the grocery store who said, it's only a virus old man, which surprised him as it does me. And since I'm of an age that means I should be careful for now and my short forever, I wonder what it is those men didn't want to understand. My mask is blue with swirls on it and reversible. 
online, I saw a mask with penises. The woman who wore it said, if you were close enough to see the penises, you were too close. Whereas if you are trying to ignore the virus, maybe you think like your own fear, it will go away with summer or ultraviolet light, even as the rest of us still hope for only a few years more before, as the signs posted randomly around the neighborhood say, this too will pass. And life as we knew it will resume because the scientists have found a vaccine. And then, if there is a then, will we remember the tens of thousands who have died or what we have learned about being ready if it comes again? Or will life know it as we knew it mean that the owners of meat packing plants will still insist workers work so close to each other that they knock elbows and that the drug companies will make their millions, which others will share too, if they've gotten a good tip from say their Senator and bought the right stock before the big discovery happens. And if it doesn't, will we inject ourselves with bleach or any other household disaffected we've been inhaling for years? Poisons like fear itself being so much more familiar, consoling even, than the possibilities of science we grow impatient with when the fix is not as quick or as simple as we'd like. The other day, I found a 30-year-old letter from my mother-in-law addressed to us in Italy. And with the gift of the address, we used Google Earth to find the street in Florence where we had lived. For a moment, we walked down Via San Nicolo and crossed the Ponte Vecchio into the city. And then I remembered that somewhere in the hills behind us was Galileo's house. He lived there in his later years under house arrest, sentenced by the Inquisition because he believed the earth was not the center of the universe. And so we stood again reading the brass plaque on one of the walls surrounding the house, thinking of how, in his confinement, Galileo might have stood looking through the telescope he had invented, its powers allowing him to see the craters of the unsmiling moon, the moons of Jupiter, and the shared infinite fields of the Milky Way. <laughs>